thank you very much indeed for joining me this afternoon, um, Lieutenant Colonel. Can we start then? 110 hostages released. How many are left in the hands of Hamas and other splinter groups? Um, well, indeed, yesterday the ceasefire, the pause, the operational pause, um, broke down after Hamas refused to fulfill their part of the deal. They refused to release 17 women and children. There are, um, to date, still 137 Israelis being held captive by Hamas. Um, and indeed, because of their, uh, f because they, they walked away from the table, basically, um, Israel ha and the, the government instructed the IDF to resume its operations against Hamas in order to fulfill our two goals of this war. Uh, make sure, uh, first of all, I would say, bring home the hostages, every last one of them. And second of all, make sure that Hamas never ca can never govern the Gaza Strip again as a terrorist entity, as a terrorist organization that abuses the power of government to conduct a terrorist attack on the magnitude that we've never experienced before. So Hamas say that uh, it was the Israelis who walked away from the table. They also claim that uh, Israelis, uh, the IDF specifically, breached uh, the ceasefire by shooting dead um, Palestinians. So parking that there, I just want to get back to the, the, the safety um, and the release of the hostages themselves. What the last seven days has shown, has it not, is that talk works. As a result, over 100 hostages have come out. Would it not make sense for Israel at this point to continue the nego negotiation and continue the ceasefire as a result? I would maintain that a ceasefire could have continued if Hamas would have implemented their side of the bargain. They you and I know that breaches of minor breaches of ceasefires always continue. No, Hamas, is, Hamas and Qatar, very, very... Hamas, Qatar and the Americans have all urged Israel to continue talks. Why didn't it? Uh, and the Americans also said that Hamas broke the deal. When they broke the deal, what they did before, even before the time frame was over, um, at six o'clock or just before six o'clock yesterday morning, they began launching rockets at us. After they decided not to hand over 17 women and children, not to fulfill their part of the deal in the hostage uh, agreement, when they decided to walk away from that, they then began launching rockets at Israel. Um, so, of course, there's, there was hope for the diplomacy, uh, but unfortunately, we don't, we're not surprised that Hamas uh, broke it down and, and decided to walk away. And therefore, for the last, for the seven days of that operational pause, we were preparing ourselves for the surprises, for attacks. Indeed, during the operational pause, um, Hamas conducted uh, attacks against us with explosive devices. Um, and indeed, where we are today now, 24 hours later, we are back in combat, engaging the enemy, dismantling and destroying their terrorist capabilities. We've conducted strikes against some 400. We're going to come, we're gonna come to that now. in a minute. I, I just want to go back to the central idea that the majority of the people that have been released um, and we're talking about the hostages held by Hamas and other splinter groups. The majority of those were released as a result of negotiation. The, we also know, do we not, that there has been a trading of um, uh, diplomatic blows between Israel and Hamas, each of you blaming the other. PM Netanyahu on Thursday, on Thursday said this, and I watched the interview. He said, so this is a full day prior to the end of the ceasefire, in the last week, we made many great achievements, including the return of many dozens of abductees. I hear the question, after this phase of returning our abductees is exhausted, will Israel return to the fighting? Uh, my answer is unequivocally yes. There is no chance we will not return to fighting. The decision was made on Thursday, the ceasefire ends on Friday, and the bombing continues today into Saturday. And that leaves hostages still in the arms of terrorist organizations and you cannot get them back militarily as fast as you could through talking. So are you coming to a conclusion independently or are you basing anything beyond uh, perhaps your very good journalistic skills? I would say no. The idea was to get home as many hostages as possible, to bring home as many. 
first of all, women and children. This was the agreement. Of course, the IDF is not responsible for the implementation or upholding of that part of the agreement. But when the government realized that Hamas has no intention to release 17 women and children, we've seen the state they came out of. Uh, Sangita. We have to take that into consideration. When Hamas decided not to transfer a list, not to implement their part of the agreement, the government instructed the military to go on the offensive. They, of course, That's claimed that they to, needed... It's not too they hard of course to understand. Claimed, and I would Lieutenant say... Lieutenant Colonel, hang on a minute. They, of course, claimed... You didn't claimed, interview, you didn't interview me during the time of the operational pause. But if you um, Hang on a minute, because... We, hang on, hang on. Hang on. May, I, may, I, may I just I address said, that? I would have said, and I interviewed quite May I just address that? We LBC. asked you to that appear on this program during the ceasefire. We asked the Israeli government to appear on this program during the ceasefire for the last four weeks that we have been asking you to appear. Neither you nor nor the Israeli government spokespeople have agreed to appear on this program. So that is the factual correction of that assertion. Let's just get um, to the next part of the Israeli um, uh, military objective, which, of course, is in the words of Benjamin Netanyahu, your mission statement is to annihilate or eliminate Hamas. According to the CIA, there are between 20 and 25,000 Hamas fighters in Gaza. How many have you killed so far? The uh, IDF has two goals in this war, as instructed by the government. First of all, to bring home the hostages, every last one of them. And second is to dismantle Hamas as a governing authority and to destroy its terrorist capabilities so that it can never hold a sword of death above our heads ever again. That is what we're doing. That's what we're do we're doing, I would say, every day. And indeed, even in the last 24 hours since we resumed our operations, we have killed tens of their terrorists in different locations in the northern Gaza Strip tens of. and in and precision strikes. And we will continue to do so. Tens of. Um, there is no there is actually no pressure on us from our perspective. Uh, there is no time limit. We have uh, time on our hands in order to implement this feat. We have to understand Hamas have governed the Gaza Strip for 16 years. In that time, they have embedded themselves extensively. How many have you killed? Or we imprisoned. are going to defeat them. We are going to operate. How many of the 20 to 25,000 the CIA, will, CIA say thousands, exist? Thousands of Hamas terrorists have been killed since the beginning of so the war. So officially, I can tell you officially, since since you, you can't, uh, when I looked it up, according to Israeli officials, between three to 5,000 Hamas fighters have been killed in the last seven weeks. But of course, according to the Hamas-controlled um, health ministry, 15 thousand Gazans have been killed during the bombing, uh, half of whom are children. Is that proportionate? Um, uh, that was, an, uh, I think, absolutely an, a reality on the ground. If you said 5,000 terrorists have been killed, that's successful. Uh, if, even if I go according to your numbers that you suggested, 20,000, that's a quarter of Hamas's capabilities. It's not my biggest CIA. Um, and, and I would say, yes, the idea and the operations that we are conducting are in order to dismantle and destroy Hamas, who have embedded themselves deeply, deeply within the civilian population. Proportionality doesn't weigh, Sangeeta, on a number. Proportionality in warfare um, weighs on distinction and weighs on military necessity. And that is proportionality, not some abstract number, which is terrifying every time I see the images on the television. They are heartbreaking. But it doesn't change the fact that the Hamas have to go. Hamas has to leave the arena for the for everyone's good. Let's there is a reality where this organization then. has conducted the most lethal, brutal, merciless attack in against Israel that has a, a history of being attacked by terrorist organizations. Nothing on this magnitude. And that Left is Colonel, when, let's they, talk about when they conducted distinction because their you have drawn the issue as of distinction. a strategic strike against us. When they conduct, please let me ask you a question. You have raised the issue of distinction, so please do us. let me ask they you about have, that. You You've raised it, and I'd like to ask you about it, if you wouldn't mind, authority. rather than just talking okay. over me. So you have raised the issue of, of distinction, and that is an absolutely crucial, I agree, to the issue of proportionality. Uh, at the start of this uh, camp military campaign by the IDF, you asked... Um, uh, over a million people to move from northern Gaza to southern Gaza. We now have 1.8 million displaced people inside Gaza now in the south. The bombing has continued. Where do you expect the displaced people and those who are originally from southern Gaza to move? 
the operations are continuing. We are evacuating specific locations to conduct our activities against centers of gravity that Hamas has established. Uh, we are doing it, I would say, step by step, strike by strike, in a way that limits the civilian casualties, but it achieves our goals as we, we outlined in the beginning. How? How are you doing it? We are asking it? people to evacuate in order to safeguard their lives. How are you asking them to evacuate? Ask the, in order to get them out of harm's way. How are you asking them to evacuate, Lieutenant Colonel? Um, we are conducting extensive efforts, in, including uh, sec text messages, um, leaflets. Uh, yesterday, we launched for specifically for this stage of the operation, uh, designated a map, in uh, an online map that each Palestinian in Gaza can identify specifically where they are. And when they're asked to move specifically, they can move to different locations which are deemed safer for them to be. So this is your map that divides Gaza into something like 2,000 um, little zones. Uh, you have to have um, Wi-Fi and uh, you have to be able to access that map and you have to be able to have enough access uh, uh, energy, electricity, to make sure that your your laptop can work or your or your uh, desktop can work. It's completely unrealistic, isn't it? Given given the total siege of Gaza over seven weeks, that anybody on the ground is going to be able to use this map in any kind of effective way. Even when you did a leaflet drop, uh, and this is verified, when you dropped leaflets asking people to uh, leave one zone and move to another, the numbers on your map didn't actually correspond to the four areas that were told to evacuate. There is no way you are going to be able to, to minimise civil, civilian casualties going forward, is there? There is, absolutely. If people listen to what we're telling them, they will be moving out of harm's How way. How can that they listen? Them. They have been starved, they don't have enough electricity, they barely have Wi-Fi, and they have nowhere to move because you've got... 2.2 million people living in a space that is half the size of the Isle of Wight. When I was watching Hamas release the hostages, I did not see any lack of cell, cell phones videoing how the uh, Israelis were being uh, dragged from one car to the other. There is no lack today in the in power. There is no lack of information. We've dropped leaflets. We make text messages. We uh, um, create a designated website in order to alleviate so that people people can be better informed. We inform uh, key stakeholders, uh, uh, such as the international humanitarian organizations on the ground and Palestinian dignitaries in the in the Gaza Strip of specific areas in order to uh, try and get people out of harm's way. By saying people can't move, you are saying, no, let them stay there and hope they don't get in. I'm, get, I'm saying get nothing of the sort. I am, there not, is a reality. I am asking you where you think they are going to move. So just to so be, clear, telling, just to be when, clear, when humanitarian organizations, everybody from the UN to UNICEF to uh, MSF to um, Action Aid say that there is a humanitarian crisis, there is not enough water, energy, fuel, or, ele or electricity, you're suggesting that that's fake news, are you? I'm suggesting that we need to be very, very cautious in coming to any conclusions. The reality, reality on the ground absolutely is a dire one for the people of Gaza. We are taking that into consideration and specifically that is why we maintain a humanitarian corridor, access to huma for humanitarian goods coming in. There's, but there's been no humanitarian convoy since I mean, last, every time since I yesterday. start speaking, you cut into me. You don't want, if you don't want to hear me speak, then we can end the the interview. If, Every time uh, I start explaining what we're doing, you cut in. You try to talk. If you don't want me, Sangeeta, we don't need to have this interview. If you want to Lieutenant interview Colonel, me, ask the question and listen to, a, listen to an answer. Lieutenant Let me Colonel, you were invited answer. onto the programme, which is why I want to speak to you. But when you say you are going to let humanitarian aid in, that is factually incorrect because there has been no convoy since uh, the end of the ceasefire yesterday. And it is my no, job there were, there to were, correct there you. There were trucks today. I think your information is... In incorrect. I'm, I'm afraid you just don't know. You just don't know. Well, thank you very much indeed for the update. And we'll check that as we go through the programme. Uh, what is your plan for the day after Israel declares success and, and having won so, the war? So, of course, I, the IDF is charged with creating a better security reality for um, the people of Israel. That is what we intend to do. It will be achieved by removing Hamas from government, making sure that they do not have the power to govern the Gaza Strip as a staging ground um, for terrorism against Israel. 
Um, that will be the outcome. Uh, we understand it is a long battle. We understand that there is no quick fix for this. As I said, Hamas have had 16 years to build their infrastructure and their c control over what's going on. And, and I would say, ideally, the people of Gaza need to determine their destiny. It needs to be a destiny without terrorists. Um, and uh, um, just, just to make it clear, when you raise a point and you want it checked, we absolutely do. Palestinian Red Crescent uh, say that the first batch of aid trucks have entered Gaza and that happened in the last hour. So thank you for alerting us to that. Uh, former National Security Advisor uh, to the Foreign Office here, Lord Ricketts, says that Israel uh, doesn't have a plan for the day after. And in fact, you're about to enter an intractable ground war, which is going to be a, a counterinsurgency campaign that will drag on for months and months and months with absolutely no exit plan. Is he right? Um, I, d I don't think he's right. No, I would say there is no fairy godmother that can wish Hamas away. We have to get rid of them. There is a long war ahead of us. Indeed, it is a huge challenge. But the end goal needs to be a Hamas that, that, that uh, it needs to be a Gaza Strip without Hamas that governs the Gaza Strip. This is the reality. We can never allow this a, an organization like Hamas to govern the Gaza Strip as a terrorist organization. The, what, what they did on the 7th of October can never be allowed to happen again. They can never be a, it, it's not just about the 7th of October, this war. It's making sure that the 7th of October can never happen again. And so while the day after is a very serious question, how do we get there and who will be running it? As I said, the Palestinians ideally need to determine their destiny, but it cannot be a destiny that is intertwined with terrorism. Lieutenant Colonel Peter Lerner, spokesperson for the Israeli Defence Forces, thank you very much indeed for your time and I hope to speak to you again.